Hi, my name is Paul Martin Hennebury. I'm president of Telos Ministries and Telos Institute. And uh, today I want to talk about what I call biblical covenantalism, which I know is not the most elegant of terms, but it's the best one I could come up with to describe my approach to the reading of scripture and its story. Let me try and give you some of the uh, basic tenets of the approach. We've already talked about the biblical covenants and one of the things that I've tried to um, emphasize is the fact that covenants are made uh, to reinforce plain speech about something important. In other words, they're meant to call attention to something that's really important that a person places themselves uh, in obligation to. So that when God makes a covenant, he's calling attention to the words that are within the oath that is the central, central part of that particular covenant. Those words are particular. Uh, they are not to be look, looked at as being ambiguous. They are not changeable and they cannot suffer uh, anything other than a literal interpretation. In other words, they can't be allegorized or spiritualized. Uh, so covenants are amplifications of plain speech about something that's important. So God makes biblical covenants. He enters into obligations, usually, apart from in the Mosaic Covenant, these are entered into unilaterally by God. They are all grace covenants because God in his goodness and in his grace, uh, he makes, uh, a, a, he enters into a relationship and makes a covenant with people for specific purposes and to accomplish particular goals. Goals that have long-term and far-reaching consequences, some of which have not even uh, been consummated even in our day. Now, because covenants therefore have this uh, unique character and this stamp of authority upon them, and because they are immovable, they are hermeneutically strategic for our understanding of the Bible and the Bible storyline. Unfortunately, they are often not taken um, as uh, being too important. They are often uh, hidden behind other agendas. For example, an agenda uh, to flatten out the specifics of biblical covenants within a, say, a redemptive historical program. Uh, everything summed up in Christ and the church. That won't do because the covenants themselves do not permit that in their wording. There's more to the biblical story than Christ and the church. Uh, or they're subsumed sometimes beneath dispensations, divine economies. The problem with that is that the dispensations then get to have a dictatorial role over the biblical covenants. But that's a role that they are not given in the Bible. In fact, uh, whereas there is very little ambiguity about the covenants of God, there is ambiguity and there are questions about the divine economies themselves and exactly what they are. Um, how they should be characterized, and what kind of clout they should have in our interpretation of the Bible. So neither of those alternatives is uh, the best alternative. A biblical covenantalism is um, an approach to the Bible that begins by looking at what covenants are, amplifications of speech, and also uh, recognizing that covenants 
uh, set a program. Because they're pledges to do something, that program has to be um, followed. It has to be uh, seen as in play until its fulfillment comes about. And its fulfillment can only uh, come about when all of those covenant obligations have been met. And they're not met spiritually because the, the words of the covenant can't be spiritualized. They have to mean what they say. Um, I mean, just to under, undergird that, imagine if I made a covenant with somebody to do, I don't know, sell something to them or do something for them. And a um, year or so later, uh, they came to me and said, well, you haven't fulfilled the covenant. You said that you would do this for me and you haven't done it. And I would say, yeah, I fulfilled it. I've just uh, done it in a different way. The fulfillment's different than what the original wording would have led you to believe, but it's an expanded or uh, spiritualized fulfillment. Well, would that person have thought that I really fulfilled the words of the covenant? Of course not. They would have every reason to believe that I had reneged on my pledge, on my obligation. And in the same way, biblical covenantalism teaches that God, once he enters into these covenantal obligations, he has to see them through, and he has to see them through literally, whether you like that word or not. He's got to do what he says he's going to do. Um, so this approach takes that seriously, and traces the various biblical covenants, Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, and its various strands of land and people and blessing for the world, uh, the Davidic covenant and its literal kingship, its earthly kingship in Jerusalem, taking that seriously. David doesn't have a throne in heaven, it's on earth. Uh, the covenant that we've seen with Phineas in Numbers 25, uh, the New Covenant, and all of the various things that are attached to the New Covenant that we'll look at another time. Uh, these things are all seen as they progress through and as they're enlarged upon throughout the Pentateuch and then into the, uh, the Old Testament prophets and then through into the New Testament. So biblical covenantalism traces those covenantal outworkings, places them within the work of the triune God in history, and particularly in the role of Jesus Christ as the one who brings all of the different threads of covenantal promise together in himself and, find, and uh, make sure that they all find literal fulfillment through him, by, as it were, passing through him, through his work, in order to find final realization. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but uh, none of the biblical covenants, apart from the covenant in Christ, uh, have what is necessary to bring about their own fulfillment. In other words, what is not built into the covenant with Noah or the covenant with Abraham or with David uh, is a, what, what's called a salvific or soteriological, uh, redemptive approach that is necessary to allow God to fulfill his covenants upon the people to whom he made them. After all, if we're all lost, if we're all um, away from God and, and going away from God in our rebellion, and we're not redeemed, and we're not justified in God's sight, how on earth can God bring about the kind of blessings that he's promised to bring about uh, without that key ingredient, without our proper relation to him? So, uh, the biblical covenants do not have the means of their own fulfillment built into them. What they need is a redemptive aspect 
provided for them which they must pass through in order to find literal fulfillment and that is provided by the new covenant in Jesus Christ. The new covenant that is in his blood. That's why when we take of the Lord's Supper we remember the blood of the covenant that he took, Luke 22. Uh, so we've entered into that new covenant. Not fully, we don't have the full um, uh, play out and consummation of that. We've still got these um, jars of clay that we live in and uh, our souls are still very much troubled by the remnants of sin within, in them. And yet we have been redeemed and we have been adopted to God and we have the Holy Spirit residing within us. Uh, we have, therefore, the earnest of what will happen in the future. Israel, as a nation, which, of course, has those great promises in the Old Testament given to them, has not uh, entered into new covenant obligation yet with God. But they will in the future. That's what many of the prophecies that we find in the Old Testament actually do predict. And Paul himself, in Romans 11, uh, 24 through 27, 28, he talks about Israel's new covenant relation once the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so that's in the future. But everything has to pass through Christ and the new covenant. So that basically is the program of biblical covenantalism. Whether there are dispensations, and there are, uh, is, is not the, the primary thing. What's primary is understanding the ongoing role of history in what I call the creation project. And this brings up the next theme that I want to talk about, which we'll talk about in the next installment, which is the teleology and the eschatology that have been built into the biblical storyline from the very beginning. <laughs>